Good afternoon to everybody, dear Vice President, dear guests, dear professors, dear students. It is a great honor and pleasure to welcome to the College of Europe, to Natalin, our special guest of today, Mr. Margaritis Schinas, the Vice President of the European Commission in charge of promoting the European way of life. Today we look forward with great interest to exchanging with you, Mr. President, about the priorities planned as well as ongoing activities of the European Commission. Dear Vice President, during your confirmation hearing at the European Parliament, you perfectly summarized what it means to be European. I would like to say that here at the College of Europe at Natalin, we share your dream and we are ready to serve. And we are ready to serve the wider European community. I hope that I am speaking on behalf of all students. I would like to say that it has been our privilege here at Natalin this year to host as many as 133 students from 32 nationalities. We create a space where students not only learn about, but also experience Europe. When we think about Natalin and about the College of Europe as a whole, we see passionate late night discussions about Europe and its future. We remember also our frequent alumni reunions, these official ones and informal ones, and eternal friendships, which we have been witnessing for many years. A beautiful microcosmos that mirrors and reflects, but also feeds and leads the wider European community. The Vice President, Natalin, hosts two academic chairs. They look at European identity, history, and civilization, and European neighborhood policy. Both produce excellent research, but also embark on a bold mission. They ask fundamental questions on what it means to be European, how we can protect, promote, and cherish the values we hold dear in an age of fast-moving globalization. We are very proud to contribute to these discussions and look forward to hearing you and your and the Commission's perspective on our common European future. Dear Vice President, you graduated from our sister campus, the College of Europe in Bruges, in 1986. <laughs> Europe was still unnaturally divided at that time. A part of Europe, including Poland, was then trapped behind the Iron Curtain. Few could have foreseen what would happen next, including our generation. We are at the, at the same age with the Vice President. But 1989 came and brought the collapse of communism in Central Eastern Europe. And symbolizing a fresh start for a reunited continent, the College of Europe decided to put its anchor in this part of Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe. The College of Europe, this College of Europe, which opened its doors in 1949, only four years after the destruction of the World War II. The College of Europe was a project, and is a project, that might be regarded as visionary or even outlandish. Yet, the experiment of 1949 and 1992 succeeded, and the College of Europe became the first truly European educational institution, preparing generations of young people for the new European future. Today, this is not an easy time for the Union. The UK's recent departure, discussions about the EU's future, the slow pace of Western Balkans integration, all dominate our policy agendas. Still, it is never appropriate to close ourselves off 
from the world when crisis or difficulty knocks on our door. Quite the contrary, we know it, our generation knows that. Now is the time to assert the openness, joy and inclusiveness of our European community. Dear Vice President, I would like to thank you so much for having accepted our invitation and coming to Natalie, and I would like to open up the floor to our discussions and open exchange with our students. Thank you very much. Dear Rector, Professors, uh, dear students, I have all these papers with me just to show you that I had prepared for a written text, but um, I'll put it away. Um, it's, it's quite emotional to, to be back to the college family uh, as an ancien. Um, I must say that it's my first time in Natalin and I didn't expect it to be so nice. I, I, uh, <laughs> everything is nicer than in Bruges. <laughs> But the essence, the essence of the two sister campus, of course, are, are the same. Um, coming here, um, I had in mind uh, uh, the words of two famous uh, compatriots of yours, uh, Eva, two famous Poles, uh, Pope Jean Paul II, who used to say that Europe <coughs> must breathe with both its lungs, the East and the West, and, and there is no better place uh, than Natalin for the Eastern lung of, of Europe's body. And I would also uh, like to remember Rector Lukashevsky, my, my rector when I was in Bruges back at the time, a legendary uh, rector, who used to say when he was addressing the the student body, he would say, 20% of you would marry someone from this same room. 60% um, of you would work for the institutions. And uh, all of you will become Europe's ambassadors forever. I, I think that he was bang on with, with, with his uh, sound bites indeed. This is what makes our school unique. And I use the term in singular, school, because for me, both campuses embody the same uh, set of values, the same uh, unwavering commitment to uh, the European project. Um, indeed, the College of Europe uh, changed my life, not only because it uh, opened uh, the gate, the door, to uh, Europe for me, but also because it opened the door to a European life for me. Actually, when I compare myself to anybody else, uh, all the anciens, I think nobody can match my college credentials. Not only I studied in Bruges, not only I was married with a Bruges uh, ancien, but my younger son was also an ancien last year. So in terms of Bruggianism, uh, no one, no one can win me. Now on a more serious note, um, since I very much feel like uh, discussing with you, let me briefly tell you, uh, mention three families of issues that probably be of interest to you first. Uh, a few thoughts on the new political cycle that has opened in Brussels last December with the new commission. Then uh, a few words on my portfolio that has uh, intrigued uh, uh, many of you and has occupied lots of public space on what is today the European way of life. And also given the age differential between you and me, I will allow myself uh, probably also on your behalf, uh, the director, to give a couple of advice, and tips, if you like. It, it always comes with age, don't misunderstand me. Okay, on the new political cycle, every political cycle that opens 
uh, in Brussels in EU politics has a central theme, an overarching objective. Um, I personally lived the uh, cycle that we could call the integration cycle when we were completing the economic and monetary union, the enlargement, this was the overarching theme. Uh, theme. Then, later on, we had the cycle of the poly crisis, let's call it the Juncker years, and even I would say part of the Barroso years, where Europe was uh, shaken by a series of uh, very intense, successive, and largely unpredictable crises that tested the resilience of our system, uh, and which I think proved that uh, Europe was much more resistant than many of its distractors were thinking or hoping actually uh, for. And now this new cycle, uh, I think, at least for me, is the cycle of the transition. A transition, this commission would have to lead the transition of the Union to uh, a greener Europe. And with a Green Deal, this has already started. Um, Europe will become the first decarbonized continent on this planet by 2050. But parallel to that, the Green Deal would also mean a series of fundamental change, not on the way we go about protecting the environment and climate, but also on the way we live in society, eat, behave. This is a fundamental choice, a fundamental choice that will shape your generation. Uh, you will be. Uh, the generation that would live this, uh, through this fundamental transition. Another transition is clearly the digital transition. This is happening to a certain extent, but I think now we are reaching uh, the most um, um, decisive uh, phase of this digital revolution in Europe. Um, first of all, uh, 5G technologies in a few years, 5G technologies will revolutionize our lives. Um, it will be uh, the ultimate connectiveness and connectivity with everything. Everything will link to everything and everything to everyone through 5G technology. Uh, by 2030, we will have about 500 billion interconnected devices that will generate unimaginable flows of personal data. This is again a world that will be for you to shape and to live, but the transition is starting now. Same thing with artificial intelligence, where uh, progress and algorithm progress will um, have a profound impact on the way we live, on the way we organize our society. And unless we find the right context to make sure that this progress towards AI would be anthropocentric, people-centric, controlled by, by, by men, uh, that the risks would be much higher than opportunities. And the third transition is something that is closer to my portfolio, is, is the transition to the societies of the future, uh, which would have to be at the same time both cohesive but also resilient. Um, what would European societies need in the future first? Security and protection. Hence, the, the Europe that protects. But at the same time, we would also need a Europe that empowers, a Europe that opens opportunities, a Europe that provides uh, uh, chances for, especially for young people, to get uh, access to the skills and education and mobility that they would need to make the best of their professional and personal lives. So this transition to a new model of society would be equally important. So contrary to uh, uh, those who think that uh, the term that will define the van der Leyen Commission would be the geopolitical commission that we can discuss later, I would prefer to say that this commission would be the commission would lead these three transitions. And the way we will go about it would, in a way, determine our, our overall success. Now, a, a few thoughts on this uh, schizophrenic and often self-flagellating debate that followed my appointment as vice president in charge of protecting, at the time, the European way of life. 
uh, since then uh, this became uh, promoting the European way of life. Um, the fact that we spend so much time to discuss, if not argue, what the European way of life means in today's Europe says a lot about us. It says mainly how uncertain we Europeans are about what others see in us as a global success. We have this tendency to doubt ourselves, our success, our progress, everything we accomplished as a union. I would never forget in, the, in Warsaw, in uh, the EU-NATO summit, I think it was the summer of 2016, immediately after the Brexit referendum, when President Obama uh, addressed uh, NATO and EU leaders and said, the European Union is the best example of success ever in international relations. Take it from me. So what others see in us, we often fail to see ourselves. That is, that we are democracies, that we protect our minorities, that the role of women is protected in society, in the family, in the workplace, that we have universal systems for education and health, that we take care of our elderly, that, they were, that we are the world champions of uh, data protection, of human rights, that we have no death penalty. Bits and pieces of all this you may find elsewhere. All of this together you will find it only in Europe. So promoting this model, defending this model, is something that more than the title of a vice presidency, is something that should be part of our of who we are and how we, we go about in, in our lives. Still, many people, especially at the left of the political spectrum, uh, uh, had a chance or rather preferred to portray this portfolio as a bulldozer, as a bulldozer that would crush everything else that is not like us, like a, a us versus the others narrative. But I had a chance, and thank you for mentioning, uh, to explain in the European Parliament that for me, the, protect, the European way of life and promoting the European way of life, for me the European way of life is a mirror. is a mirror that reflects our diversity, the richness of our traditions, the fact that we are united in diversity, and that we want to keep it like this. I don't think that our model of success would be a homo europeus, where we would like uh, raise, educate, brief, project the same way of thinking. What makes us strong is precisely that the homo europeus does not exist. And the homo europeus is the aggregate of uh, what each one of us represents. And in terms of uh, applied policy, if you like, under this vice presidency that I have the honor to assume we would have a cluster of policies and portfolios that pertain to the Europe that protects, mainly security, cyber security, internal security, hybrid threats, um, but also migration, which entails working with the countries of origin and transit to make sure that people get more opportunities where they live rather than putting their lives in the hands of the smugglers in the Mediterranean, that we have a strong management of our external border, and that we have a system of solidarity amongst ourselves that allows us to share the, the responsibilities of asylum altogether instead of uh, projecting them only to the countries of first entry. And another part, uh, also with me would be the Europe that empowers uh, policies, namely education, skills, public health, youth, sport, which is all these sets of priority areas that Europe would need uh, to bring these opportunities element in the resilient societies of tomorrow I was referring to you earlier. This is a unique job. This is a new job. It never existed in the European Commission. And it's a job as a fellow uh, 
college uh, student, I can tell you that I'm very excited about. Because these are areas, policy areas, that up to now have been developed at EU level on a silo track. And we were hoping that at the end, everything that we would produce would somehow link. Now we're starting upstream. We know what we want to achieve. And we work through this uh, chantier, through these work streams, to make it happen. OK, final chapter advice and tips or shall I keep it for the Q&A no let's let's do it now um, lo looking at you it's like uh, looking back at myself uh, 33 years ago um, it's a unique privilege it's a unique chance to have this opportunity unique Believe me, it's something that will uh, uh, seal your lives in a way that probably you do not even imagine. It will shape who you are, who will be, um, and it will open many more opportunities that you can imagine. This is a great school. It's a school that will define you, but it's also a school that will bestow a certain sense of responsibility on you. Probably you don't see it now, but you will see it as, as you develop on your career tracks. Because whether you like it or not, you will feel when you go out of this place as a, a sort of a join shareholders in the project that is called the European Union or European integration. Uh, you don't get this in other academic establishments, but you will get it at the college. And this is a responsibility. Because being a shareholder entails that you have an interest to defend the stock of the company to which you hold the share. Or put it differently, if the stock of the company goes down, you certainly lose yourself. So the value of defending this company, standing up for the European Union, defending the fundamentals of the project, is something that you should assume wholeheartedly. So, and assume it not only as a values project or as a stock project, assume it as a believer, as believers in the project, which I'm sure you are. Otherwise, you would not be on a campus like this studying what you study. Second and final tip of advice, and then I will sit down, I promise. When I joined the commission, I was 27. And um, I had the chance to uh, meet, well, uh, the legendary Secretary General of the time, Emile Noel, who was there for 27 years. And he has the habit to uh, invite for lunch the neo wolves, the, the young wolves of the institution. He was on his way out, but he was inspired to get lunch, to invite lunch. The, the youngsters. Huh? I was 26, 27. So after lunch or during lunch, he gave us uh, two practical pieces of advice, which I'm repeating now to you. He said, advice number one, if you are in European affairs, in European politics, in European careers, take care of yourselves, because this is a demanding life. It's lots of coming and going and traveling. It's not an office job. So eat well, sleep well, exercise. I found it a bit odd as an advice. But then, as years passed by, I, I understood the value of it. And then he said, and the final piece of advice. If you are in this world of European politics, never forget qu'en Europe, on la contre toujours 
la même personne pour une deuxième fois. What was the meaning? That in Europe we always meet the same person twice. It was his way of saying, be nice to your fellow Europeans. Be nice to the ones who are sitting next to you. Be nice to the other common shareholders. Thank you. That's true that responsibility and being nice is, seems to be simple, yes. but it is one of the most difficult tasks in our life, to take responsibility and to be nice to others, not only to tolerate them, but to have a capacity to look at others through their eyes, not through our eyes. Understanding that others do have their eyes. So, as I said at the beginning, I am at the same age as president, so I would say I would agree 100% with all advices. This is the historical experience of our generation. I would say that we have succeeded. We had a good luck. We could have seen changes in Europe which brought peace uh, to the whole continent. And we would like to help you to be prepared for your challenges. That is why I am so grateful to President that you, he could come and talk with you. Try to use this occasion not only because he's Vice President of the European Commission, but because he's an experienced person, committed European, trying to use your time. I would like to open up the discussion. Before asking questions, please stand up and introduce yourself. Shall we start? Who is? OK, then please do, on my right. It works. Okay, start doing that without micro. <laughs> Giovanna, it works? It's not good to be uh, like this. Yes, you can. You can. You can. <laughs> Go on. Now it works, okay. Um, my name is Niklas Meyer from Germany. Thank you so much for your speech. I think it's a really interesting topic and an interesting discussion. And in order to maybe understand uh, this new portfolio better, I would like to ask uh, two questions. The first one is about the timing. Why do we now need this portfolio? Why do we now need to protect or at least to promote our European values or the European way of life? Um, to what extent does it have to do with uh, maybe migration in the last years, maybe refugee, the refugee crisis in the last years, and the rise of uh, far white parties who very often play with this fear of uh, losing our national identities? And to what extent is, is this like a response to, to this fear? Uh, the second question would be in order to understand better what exactly is the European way of life? Because for me, at least, I think there's a difference between the broader values that you described, like uh, uh, um, freedom of, of speech and the, 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 the um, data protection and so on and so forth, and the European way of life, which is maybe more like uh, how do we structure our day, what kind of beliefs we have, does it also touch religion or not? Um, and in this uh, sense, um, how do we have to protect our European way of life? And does it mean that if other people come to Europe, uh, they will have to adapt the European way of life, have to give up their own cultural uh, habits or, or, or their way of structuring their day? What exactly does it mean in this, in this sense? Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I ask you to be nice to people, but not to me. <laughs> I, I invite you to be nasty to me. I didn't <laughs> so, so, yes. I. I, I've, I tried to explain that uh, this 
uh, counter narrative that the European way of life is us versus the others uh, was not what motivated the creation of this job and certainly is not what I believe in. If you would ask me for an alternative way of explaining it, um, I would tell you that um, today we Europeans, we represent something like 8% um, of the world population and going down. Um, around 20% share of the global GDP also going down. And 50%, 5-0, of global social spending. That means one in two euros or dollars spent worldwide on social policy is spent in Europe. So what is the European way of life? Is to project these three figures to the generation of your children and your grandchildren. And to ask ourselves if something that our generation delivered to your generation is something that your generation will be able to deliver to the generation that will follow you. Part of the answer is whether we can defend our socioeconomic model that was able to produce a certain demography, a certain economy, and a certain social ethos. So instead of going into this very um, often conspirational analysis that this is to keep uh, uh, migrants out and this is a gift to the far right, I would turn this argument around. This is about our future. And the future which is not exclusive, it's not us against them. You mentioned migration. What makes Europe Europe on migration is that we are and we will always be an asylum destination. Those who flee wars, dictatorships, misery, should know that Europe will always be there for them. But at the same time, those who have no legal right under international law to be under Europe's protection should go back. Is this intolerant? Is this, I would say, this is the embodiment of, of a European way of life. This is what we should do. And the final thought on the extreme right. When this discussion on the European way of life was in full swing, the ones who were quarreling, who were feeling un un unsettled about this debate, were Le Pen and these forces of darkness. Because they wanted society to believe that this is the victory of their ideas. But the fact that we chose for this title, that means that they were right. And it was exactly the opposite that was happening. That with introducing such a notion into mainstream politics, we deprive of the extreme right and the Europhobic uh, extremists the monopoly of something that is not theirs, but it's, it's a common good. Um, probably this needs some more explaining. Yes, I had the chance to do it in Parliament, but it is not black and white as this debate at the, at, at the first glance uh, would appear. Thank you. Next, Daphne, you were the first. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Um, my name is Daphne, I'm from Greece, and I think I speak to, from the part of all of us here that we feel extremely honored and by your presence and inspired by your words. Um, so I know that uh, you're very used to answer to um, questions relevant to migration when it comes face to Greeks, so I decided to ask you something different today. Um, you mentioned uh, the three priorities of on transition and uh, on environment digital and then there is also gender equality and social inclusion and from my understanding of this um, 
issues, we cannot tackle them as such, we cannot tackle them alone. It has to be an interconnection between them, between all the different policies, so to be also as to for them to be effectively tackled. So I would like to ask you, how do you perceive the challenges in your portfolio and how are you planning to, to address them during your term? Thank you very much. Yes, this, this third transition, uh, Daphne, the, the third transition I think is, is the most difficult one, the more complex one. Because if you like, the green transition and the digital transition are transitions that can be, in, in policy terms, can be the result of a roadmap. And, and this is happening, by the way. You know that the, 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 the green transition has this 2050 objective for zero emissions, have intermediate targets. In parallel, we have the just transition funds. We have uh, 100 billion euros in investments. Same thing in digital. But when we discuss transition to resilient and cohesive societies, there is not a, a, a magic bullet. There is not a a big bank, uh, there is not a, a switch that you can, a button to push and, and these societies will emerge. And um, it would require uh, lots of work, lots of uh, uh, education, uh, lots of mobility, change of attitude, uh, cross-fertilization of uh, interdependence of views, intergenerational solidarity, you and I come from a country, Daphne, where our parents and grandparents sorted out their problems at the expense of their children and their grandchildren. Because a country that creates a debt of 340 billion euros, it's not only that creates a colossal debt, it also fails its basic inter intergenerational uh, solidarity and fairness. So these societies, where of course equality, um, rights, uh, these societies would require uh, investment. Investment in, in attitudes, in education, in tools, in programs, in money, in educational uh, aspects. And they will not be easy, but it would have to be done. Yes, please. Um, hello, my name is Esmet and I come from Egypt. Thanks, Mr. Vice President, for your interesting speech. Um, my question is about the term of European way of life. And uh, for the first glance, when I was uh, reading your tweet, when you tweeted on Twitter that you're very happy to be uh, nominated as the Commissioner for Protecting the European Way of Life, I thought that this term is a bit exclusive. And uh, I thought also that one of the things that might be very needed for that protection of the European Way of Life is inclusivity. So my question is about the young people and to which extent they are included in that portfolio's work especially that Europe that now more than a third of the population are young people under 30 years old in the age and that portfolio is meant to look at the future of Europe and these young people are going to be the future. So I wanted to ask about the strategies or the means that you're involving and including young people in this process and what's the extent of it. Thank you. Let, let me share with you, I will come to youth, but let me share to you an Egyptian story, and something that um, I witnessed myself. At the height of the Arab Spring, um, when there was the Tahrir Square movement, I was, I was watching TV, I don't know where exactly I was, but I was somewhere with time, I, don't ask me where, probably I was a member of the European Parliament at the time. I had time. So there was, uh, a girl in Tahrir Square with a scarf, compatriot of yours, and there was a CNN um, journalist transmitting live from Tahrir Square. So he puts the microphone in front of this young lady, and she goes live in American television saying the following, saying, we are fighting for our lives. 
We want to live free. We want to live as they live in Europe. She didn't say the United States, Australia, or Canada. She said Europe. And this is, for me, this was a moment where I was trying to explain this earlier, that people from outside see in Europe m much more than very often we see ourselves. Now, in terms of youth, youth is, um, is a policy is, is, is relatively young, recent policy in the EU. We had, of course, education, we have culture, but youth programs have developed uh, recently. Of course, the, the jewel in our crown is the Erasmus uh, uh, program that you know well. And I, I don't think that Erasmus is purely youth program, it's, it's an educational mobility program, although uh, up to now, we managed to have about 10 million Europeans uh, that benefited from this unique experience and uh, uh, 15 billion euros, 10 million uh, Erasmus students and 1 million Erasmus babies, by the way, <laughs> as Juncker would say. Not during the exchanges, as a result, <laughs> as a result of the exchanges. Uh, now, <laughs> Now we have proposed the tripling of the Erasmus funds, so from 15 to 45 uh, billion for the next five years, and we hope that about 20 to 25 million Europeans will benefit. So this is, this is in a way, in massive scale, what the college does <laughs> uh, at, at an educational level. We also have two new generation uh, youth programs that are very interesting for people like you. First is the Discover EU, which is a sort of a very recent program that would give you a, a travel voucher uh, to discover the union when you turn 18. So it's, an, it's like a, an opportunity to discover and share. And the European Solidarity Corps, which is uh, a, a, a program that allows you to, to young Europeans to provide um, voluntary work uh, across the Union, but also take part in emergency response situations. So it's, it's something that is recent, but it's something that will continue. And of course, uh, central to all that is also our objective to create a European education area by 2025 uh, by converging, uh, um, helping universities and, and education systems to converge uh, towards common curricula and, and common uh, diplomas. I would like to come back for a while to your comment on Arab Spring and this interview with a young uh, lady there. I would like to say that we, uh, Natalie, we travel every year to Ukraine in the first semester for study trip and our students um, had a chance to meet with those who were on Euromaidan, and I would like to say that there were three revolutions in Ukraine. The first one was called Revolution on Granite, the second one was Orange, but the third one was Euromaidan Revolution. It speaks also a lot about aspirations of Ukraine, but also it tells a lot about us. If, you if, if I could complete the, the, in Maidan, we had the first people killed uh, waving EU flags, and, and this is not something that should go unnoticed. If you don't mind, I will go on the left, and then I will come back here, and then on my right. On the left, there are any questions? Yes, Anna Maria. Good evening. My name is Anna Maria Leva. I'm from Hungary. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks that you made. Um, you mentioned a lot of times um, European future, and you also mentioned how dynamically can everything change. So I would like to ask you, what do you think are the elements of the European values or elements of the way of European life that will be relevant in 20 years in the future? Thank you. Yes. I this is what in California I call a mega question. <laughs> um, I think what I was uh, replying to your uh, uh, German colleague earlier would be the, 
the main determinant of the way we, we go about our future. Namely, whether we will be able to maintain a certain demography, a certain economy, and a certain inclusiveness that would allow our success to go from generation to generation. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because the, um, we live in a different world where our competitors are getting stronger, where our demographics are getting weaker, where our standards are high up, but not always followed by the ones who are competing with us. So it's not going to be easy. But it will have to be done. It will have to be done because unless we get these elements right, um, our future will be determined not by our decisions, but by the impact of decisions taken by others. L let me put it differently. The way that we have managed to succeed as Europeans for the last 50, 60 years is because the founding fathers, <laughs> the ones who imagined our world, got it right. So in a way, we are spending the political, the, the, the interest of the political capital they invested in the, in the 50s after the war. So this is the challenge of your generation, to do the same for the future, starting by the transitions. I think these transitions would be uh, much more important than, than we may think now. Uh, good evening, my name is Alexandra Blin. I'm coming from France. Uh, thank you for being is, uh, here with us tonight. Um, well, uh, I will have a very nice question and a bit less nicer question. Um, <laughs> Finally. Uh, above all, <laughs> yes. Um, my question is about the, the conference the um, Commission just said about the future of Europe. Um, so. That's the nice or the nasty one? The, the nice question is, <laughs> what can we expect from this conference? Um, because, I mean, if we sit for a conference and we think, they might have some results. And depending on the results, uh, are we not going in a trap like uh, the constitutional conference for the treaty in 2005, especially because, of course, um, in time of crisis, we might have been united, but at the moment I have the feeling that we are really not united on very important questions and issues right now. Thank you. Yes, the Conference on the Future of Europe is the result of a famous speech by a famous President of the Republic from the country you know best. Who, who happens to be tonight in, in, in Warsaw. He, in his very powerful Sorbonne speech, he triggered, in a way, the process that leads to the press conference. And, and why did he do it? Well, because if you go back to May 2017, the one who defended our European way of life against the forces that wanted another bulldozer sort of approach to Europe, it was him. It was him. He crushed uh, the anti-European forces. So he was entitled to, to this speech, and this speech uh, triggered this uh, conference, which I think I'm not uh, unveiling any secret if I tell you that will be launched on the 9th of May, Europe Day. Now, uh, I'm not sure what will come out of this, uh, but I, I know what I don't want to see coming out of this. What I don't want to see coming out of this conference is a process through which Europe, uh, sorry, Brussels talks to Brussels. I mean, if this happens, it would be a failure. I have spent 30 years of my life in European politics. I discussed all sorts of European issues, but I have never discussed with anybody interinstitutional relations. No one cares. No one ever told me comitology, co-decision. You know, people don't care about interinstitutional dynamics and Brussels bubble. Uh, so if the conference becomes an autistic Brussels to Brussels thing, it would be a flop. 
Same thing. If the conference becomes some sort of um, evangelization where Illuminati Brussels types will visit the provinces to explain what the Department of Truth thinks on Europe, that would also be a failure. It has to be done the other way around. Brussels should be told by the real people what matters in European politics. And finally, there are certain issues that have a certain impact on European democracy, which I think need to be discussed. The key question, of course, is treaty change or no treaty change. So what we have, is it enough to build our future or not? This is a question that goes beyond interinstitutional relations, a question about fundamentals. And another question is how we decide our leaders in Europe. Yeah. Spitzenkandidat, not Spitzenkandidat. Th this is also something that is not Brussels bubble. This is also a question of democracy. So I think that I told you what I don't want to see. So by contrast, what I would like to see is a genuine debate on European democracy, on how our future would be structured. And I would also like to see more bottom-up uh, proceedings, more like town hall type meetings, agoras, uh, where normal people uh, put forward ideas, not, not the other way around. One question. Mm, OK, Thibault. One, one boy, maybe, if I may ask. Positive discrimination. Please. Mm -hmm. And then you, absolutely. <laughs> and then you, you want to talk. Sorry, because I have a Two, and then um, the lady in red. Uh, As a written text, I, I better worry. On small notes. <laughs> Not all of these will be uh, the <laughs> question. Uh, Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for being here today and for sharing your words with us. Uh, I'm Tone from the Netherlands. And my question relates to something you said about the fact that the EU has the tendency to doubt uh, its own achievements and its own success. And very often um, there's more success and resilience than doubt when kind of warrant. Uh, but I'm wondering, isn't doubt in itself and self-reflection a fundamental aspect of the European way of life? And, um, and also what kind of caused this success and resilience in the first place? The ability to reflect what we do and how we can change them. And if you look nowadays at the kind of digital compartmentalization of our societies, uh, bubble formation also here in this room, uh, but, but everywhere. There is increasing bubble formation, fragmentation of societies. So a post-truth era, if you will. And misinformation dilutes critical reflection. So in your opinion, what can your department do to ensure that we are united in doubt as Europeans and not divided in dogma? Thank you. Mm, that's a very interesting angle. First of all, let me tell you how much I agree with you when you say that doubt and uh, asking ourselves the right questions has always been a, a motor of change. I think this is something that we should not be ashamed of. I'm not discussing doubt as a motor of change. I do not like systematic self-flagellation and uh, undermining, underappreciation of, of what we have collectively achieved. I, I love criticism. I, I spent five, the last five years of my life coming out in front of uh, scores of journalists every day today being criticized on everything that we did or we didn't do. And that was healthy. That was healthy because it keeps us and not only me as a spokes, but also our policy making uh, people on their toes. That's a good thing. But self-flagellation is not, is not, especially when it concerns certain of, the, of, our, of our fundamental successes uh, uh, that we have to be able to defend and promote. Now, on the bubble and on the, uh, th this discussion I, I have, I have uh, followed it, uh, the same line of argument comes as a bubble, but the same 
can also come as an elite. Uh, so this, this is a question of elites, this is a question of bubble. There I beg to differ because I don't think that people here in this room we are either bubble nor elites. If we were elites, I think we would have all stayed at home benefiting from the privileges of our elite uh, upbringing. We wouldn't struggle to make a European life, a European career, a European future. You are here, I would say, precisely because you are not elite. <laughs> The same thing I also learned, heard uh, repeatedly in these five years about the, the faceless Brussels elites. And I was like, hold on a minute. Tusk, Tusk's father was a carpenter in Gdansk. Juncker's father was a steel worker in Luxembourg who escaped uh, uh, a detainee camp uh, from Russia where she was uh, recruited by force by the Nazis. And Tajani's uh, father was a junior uh, military officer and his mother a teacher. I mean, are these the European elites? <laughs> these are not elites. These are people who defend the project. So um, I would, uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity, I would make a distinction between this notion of people chasing their dreams and people wanting to defend their privileges. It's not the same. It's not the same. And um, um, OK, the Brussels bubble, it's a different thing. Because the Brussels bubble is, is not an elitist thing. It's, it's another pathology. It's the so-called eco-chamber effect. Because we all there very close together, officials, politicians, MEPs, journalists, and very often we consume the echo of our words. And we feel that this is the real world. It's not. It's the echo of what we think. But that, again, it's, it's not something necessarily bad provided that people like you and others challenge it. And I can tell you that uh, there are many descending and iconoclastic voices that challenge the Brussels bubble. OK. Two voices from here and then <laughs> here. Who would like? You don't. OK, please. Hello, uh, dear Vice President, thank you very much for being here for us and thank you for your advice. I'm Shahira Tarash, I'm Tunisian. Uh, I, if, you, uh, if you don't mind, I want to take you away from values, etc., because European values are very clear for me, which, which is why I'm here. And I have a question on hybrid war, uh, because my master's is on hybrid war frames. And I want to know your definition of hybrid war and what do you think is the aim of hybrid war? So that's it. Thank you. OK, what's the definition of hybrid war? Uh, hybrid war is a um, set of um, um, coordinated, multi-source um, uh, events targeting systems or people, notably in the area of foreign relations and uh, external security. This is as, as forensic a definition one can make, but I can give you a couple of examples uh, as a practitioner. The first day that the president, the then president Poroshenko of Ukraine uh, stepped into the Berlemont, the, the headquarters of the European Commission. The moment he crossed the door, the whole commission email system crashed. <laughs> the, the moment he came in. And uh, that was restored uh, an hour and a half later when he came out. That's a hybrid threat. The day that the new Austrian government composed 
of uh, an EPP party and the Green Party take over, its main informatics system, computer system, is attacked. By whom? Someone who would like to say, why are my friends not in your government? I would guess. And um, the same time that uh, uh, the European Council um, uh, in December uh, condemns the illegal drillings uh, of Turkey in uh, Cyprus and Eastern Mediterranean, the Greek system crashes. So these are hybrid threats. This means that these are not accidental uh, elements. These are state-sponsored or quasi-state-sponsored threats that are developed. These are new threats that go beyond the traditional uh, aspects. And these are elements that we need to, to factor in and uh, protect against. <laughs> we are proposing now in June, I think we will be ready with a, an EU strategy for security union. And we, our ambition is to cover all these new, uh, new elements, new threats. First of all, my name is Borja from Spain. Um, I'm really, I would like to say thank you for the, the ideas that you brought us here and that you bring us to think now. And uh, especially for me, I'm, I'm really grateful for one thing, and is that you did not talk about institutions nor policies. You talk about values and projects. And here is my question. I, I, I find it really, really interesting, because in here we are all talking every time we have these classes about institutions, right? But we, we later we discuss about the project. And it's interesting, because when you started, um, it seems for me, at least, that we were cooperating together because we had a project, right? So people were embarking themselves, cooperating with others, because they had this vision, yes? But then later, when I was a kid, I was asking people, and it seemed that people that are being born into the European Union were saying, now we are connected because we have the same institutions. But they did not feel that they, they had, they were embarking themselves in this project that I clearly see. I was clearly seeing that, but I, I, it seems that now we are focusing on those institutions, but we kind of forgot to explain or, or, or think about these projects. So my question regards this. We have the institutions. We had that project. We worked a lot towards achieving it. We, we created a European Union, and now, what is our project? What is our vehicle to embark all ourselves from all our countries and all the ones that can come from people all around the world to embark in something that they feel part of it towards a future that we are creating and that we can create? Because I think in here is what we are either lacking about thinking about it or we have it, but we are lacking in explaining it to others. So I would like to know what is this project that you think personally or politically, that we could embark ourselves, believe, and work together, cooperating between each other towards that. Thank you. Yeah. In, in terms of values and institutions, you are right. I, I personally prefer, sorry, I personally prefer to avoid institutionalizing everything because it, I find that institutionalizing everything does not do justice to the substance of, or to the raw materials that we need to consume when we discuss. Yeah. Having said that, though, if you look back uh, at the European project, what defined uh, European integration was not only the idea that losers and winners of the big war, we would cooperate. That was the idea. But what defined the success was also that they accompanied this with institution building with institution building, that, that they dressed values with institution. And in your own country, um, after uh, the Franco years, the fact that the, the, the founding fathers of the Spanish uh, democracy 
invented a system, uh, an ecosystem of institutions, regional, uh, national, was precisely for the same reason, because they thought that only through institutions the, the democracy would. Now, the question is, is a good one. It says, OK, now we've built all these institutions. Now our generation, what's our call? Is it more institution to more institution building to safeguard our future, or, or more ideas, and then the institution would follow? I would say, if you ask me, that the challenge for you now to, to, to keep uh, keeping this project alive is not to lose sight of the historical perspective that the project uh, represents. And I'm delighted to learn that you teach European history uh, and civilization here, which is not the case in, in the other campus, by the way. <laughs> Why, why does it matter? Well, it matters because, you know, not people of your generations do not have that sense of history uh, very present in their, they do not. And they do not because it's, history is, is, is not very well taught in our secondary systems. Then our education systems push people to, to other more specialized tracks. So the chance for you is not to lose sight of the historical perspective of what Europe uh, represents. Have you seen this movie, 1917? Go and see it. This, 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 is, this is why we defend Europe, you know, because in this continent we had the sad privilege twice in the last century to see what happens when these forces of evil win the day. The first war, this movie ended in the cenotaphs in Central Europe. And in the Second War, it ended in Auschwitz. So we know, we know in Europe what, what went wrong. So more than institutions, more than how we dress our values, what you have to keep alive is this sense of historic inevitability. That the European Union, that the European integration is a project vindicated by history. We are, I mean, I don't want to sound now melodramatic or lyrical, but you know, have no doubt that we are on the right side of, of history. And this is what matters. This is what should keep the flame alive. And then institutions will follow, and probably treaty, no treaty. But don't lose sight of this historic perspective. I would like to add one thing, that we have a chance to ask only one question, so think it over. And uh, in, the, in the meantime, I would like to comment on these institutions and ideas. Somebody much more wiser than I am said that without people, without their ideas, nothing can happen. But without institution, nothing will remain. Nice. Nothing will last. Nice. And it is important. And we have to remember about that. We have to be creative. We have to be brave wise with ideas, but we have to work. We have to take the responsibility for the implementation of the ideas. Without that, we will not survive also that within nice. the Union. The last question, the first row. <laughs> the lady. Hello, Commissioner. I'm very glad that you um, I mean, came here today and gave us the speech. Um, I'm Aisha, I'm from Turkey, and uh, I came to the school precisely for this project of which is Europe and uh, what it represents. Um, but I've noticed a lot from where I lived um, and from what I've heard that people are not actually aware of what Europe represents and the project behind it and uh, why it was here and what it achieved. And this is why some people are also not hostile but uh, don't really... Um, feel in touch with this, with this project, which also makes them doubt it a lot. Do you think that in this new commission of, you talked about transition, do you think that promoting the idea of Europe and the project that it represents should be one of, one of the elements that should be regarded as very important because um, humanizing and really re like um, reminding the people of the essence of the project is very important and I think it's, it's very, uh, 
it's forgotten. Thank you. How nice uh, for this to be asked by by a young girl from Turkey. How nice! It's 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 really very telling. Um, I think that one of the th reasons that um, the risk that you mention exists is, and here I go back to our Dutch friend and fully assume that what problem that we, something that we did wrong is that we very often Brusselized the European Union project. Um, we very often come across as very geeky, technical people with suits like the one I'm, I'm wearing now. Uh, we didn't spend lots of time on explaining, on defending, on, on debating. We thought that, uh, you know, our truth, our values will be understood. And this was a mistake. This was a mistake. And it's a mistake that we should not repeat around the Conference of the Future of Europe. And it's a mistake that calls urgently for the the world, I'm not sure the word exists, but it calls for the de the European project, taking Europe out of Brussels as much as we can. That's one thing. A second thing that we need is that we need a bit more emotions and storytelling in, in the way we explain Europe. Uh, this is also something where we failed because we produce many good uh, graduates from Bruges, from Natalin, from the LSE, good lawyers, good economists, but not necessarily good storytellers. And we need storytellers. We need examples. We need Bono uh, from the uh, U2. <laughs> he said this sentence that I would have liked to say myself. He said, Europe is a thought that needs to become a feeling. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. That's what we need. We need, uh, I mean, we need, we discovered with my colleagues when I was a spokesperson, we discovered the young, the oldest Erasmus student in Europe, a gentleman from Valencia, 82 years old, who was doing an Erasmus in Bologna in himself, his Europe that is a feeling, not a thought. You know, this is the sort of things, and I fully agree with you, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm very positively <laughs> surprised that it comes from someone from a neighboring country, uh, the need to underline this, that this is not something that happens because it happens. It's something that happens because we need to help it happen. Thank you all very much. I enjoyed it a lot, I must say. <laughs>